let's start with who am I? My name is Christopher Weidegel. I work as a freelance contractor at Netnode. I have a background in sort of software development, but what I've been doing is usually close to the hardware. So I've been doing device drivers for Linux for, well, since 95 or something like that. I, I'm not really an FPGA developer, but I know enough about FPGAs to be dangerous. So I, 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 I know how to talk to people who do develop hardware and work with FPGAs, and I sort of know enough to glue things together that other people have built. So the actual development that I'm going to talk about here was done by a company called Assured in Gothenburg. So I can actually skip the slide because you talked about all this. But Netnode, I'm part of the t time and frequency group at Netnode. So we have a bunch of redundant clock nodes with redundancy, all those racks. And what's interesting is, well, we use GNSS for synchronization on time scales. As Puff said, we usually keep them within 10 nanoseconds. I think the worst ex excursions from UTC SP, which is the Swedish standard time, the definition of Swedish time, the worst ex excursions are about 20 nanoseconds. So we provide NTP and now also NTS. This is a free service of, over the internet. Anybody can use it. So if you have an NTP or NTS client, please talk to use our servers. We're not going to complain. We're not going to block you, even if you send a, mil uh, a thousand requests a second. Let's sort of go ahead. We handle about 700,000 requests per second anyways, and we use a percent of our capacity. So we sort of feel free. And NTP can be accurate, or you shouldn't really trust NTP to be more accurate than about 10, nano, uh, 10 milliseconds. It can be a lot better if you have a few hops to the closest NTP server, but there, over the public internet, you can have delays, buffer bloat, all, all that, which means that you can't really rely on NTP to be extremely good. So if you need more accurate time than that, well, for example, Netnode has PDP grandmasters. So if you lease a fiber to us or have a direct connection to us, we can sell a PDP service with better guarantees where we, well, we can basically guarantee time to microsecond, down to a microsecond if you need it. So what is NTP then? Well, NTP is basically the protocol for time exchange over the internet. It's a really old protocol. It's been around since 1985. So it's one of the first sort of application protocols used on the internet. And there was sort of proto NTP implementations even before that. But it's been in RFC since 1985. NTP has no practical security really. It's, there is something called authentication where you can add a MD5 or SHA-1 hash to a NTP packet, but it uses shared secrets. So basically for each client you have, you need a shared secret. And this doesn't really scale to internet users. I mean, we can do that with, with an important customer, but we can't do that with billions of users on, on the internet. There is no other practical security really. There was a proposal quite a while ago called AutoKey, but AutoKey is fairly old by now and the encryption used and things like that, it doesn't really stand up to mod modern ways of cracking encryption, so it's, it's basically broken today. So NTS, what is that? Well, that's basically NTP with security. So it adds authentication, it adds encryption, it's NTP with scalable security. So it's similar to how to, if you want to compare NTS and NTP, it's based on HTTPS compared to HTTP, and basically you know that you shouldn't use HTTP anymore because it's susceptible to uh, manual middle attacks, uh, hijacking, uh, eavesdropping, all of that. So Netnode have been participating in development of NTS. I think Netnode got involved in the ITF draft and RFC process uh, around 2018. I got involved in 2019, did the second proof of concept implementation of, of NTS at the ITF hackathon in Prague. And all this led up to NTS actually being accepted as an RFC in September 2020. So it's, well, it, technically it's not an internet standard, but it's, it's the next closest thing as you, you probably know the process. So RFC 8915, if you want to look, at, look it up. Next thing, what is an FPGA? Well, it's a piece of programmable hardware. It's 
not as efficient as doing your own custom ASIC, but it's often quite good enough if you want to do implement something pretty close to how you do it in hardware. An FPGA is basically a bunch of lookup tables. It, it's between a couple of thousand, it can be a couple of million in, in a larger FPGA. And with a lookup table, you can do things like implement a logic gate and or, and if you also add a not, well, then you can do anything which is a computer. That's sort of basic computer science. You can also use these lookups tables, for example, as registers if you want to do soft CPU. So I guess you heard about RISC-V, which is an open source uh, CPU core, and you can run RISC-V in an FPGA, for example, if you want to. So one of the big advantages of an FPGA also is that it's, since you have all these lookout tables all running in lockstep, you can do a lot of things in parallel. So it, it's good for some kind of algorithms. So let's start with the basics of NTP. So this is plain old NTP, no security at all. So it's stateless UDP. It's only 48 bytes of UDP payload, and usually that comes in an Ethernet packet with an Ethernet frame, IP frame, the checks, normal checksums. It's fairly simple. All the fields in an NTP packet, they're at fixed positions. So there's a mode which tells if it's a packet from a client to server, server to client. There are other modes, but well, nobody uses them, almost. There's information about leap seconds. So when a leap second is coming up, it's going to indicate that there is a leap second coming up, and then when the leap second is over, the flags go away. There's estimated precision where a server tells the client that this is how good my clock source is. This is my estimate of how accurate my clock is. There is also receive time, uh, transmit time. So when the server receives the packet, it timestamps it. It when it when it expects to transmit the packet, it that's the timestamp it puts in the packet. So you can basically remove the processing time from the, when you're trying to estimate the time, you, you can remove the processing time on the server. Authenticated NTP just adds a MD5 SHA-1 hash at the end. And as I said, this is a shared secret between a client and server, so it doesn't scale. I think you can have, in theory, you can have 64K different shared keys. But that's the maximum number of users, and, and it's also going to use a lot of RAM and all, to keep that information. So, well, it doesn't scale. Since, well, an NTP FPGA implementation is fairly simple. So you basically get the packet, verify the Ethernet IP checksums, then the server fills in the metadata and all the timestamps. So that rightmost part, that's the NTP UDP payload. So the server fills in all that information, swaps the source and MAC address, source the, uh, swaps the source and IP, source and destination IP address. And this is actually a bit of cheating because we should really put in the next top router, but it's easy to just sw swap the data. And un unless you've done something strange with the routing, it's going to work. Calculate the checksums and then transmit the packet. So this is really easy to do, to do in FPGA. NTP, NTP is something that Netnode has been doing for a long time. And in 2016, Netnode made or started using an FPGA implementation of NTP. So this is how NTP implemented, implemented in FPGA, and that was the board Patrick showed a little while ago. So it can handle, the board has four times, four 10 gigabit ports, and it can handle four times 10 gigabit of NTP traffic at wire speed. And the reference board, if you want to know about it, it's called VC709. You can buy it from Silinx for about $5,000, I think. And it has about 690,000 logic gates, or, or, or not logic, uh, logic gates, it's called logic cells and the basic lookup tables. And this reference board, we put it in a rack PC, which provides power and control the monitoring of this FGA board. And here's the architecture of the FTP board. So up on the left, there's a PCI Express block. That's what connects to the PCI bus on the host PC. And that is then bridged to an AXI slave, which is another kind of bus that we're using internal in the FPGA. So that's used for control and st uh, re retrieving status from the FPGA. Down on the left-hand side, we have two clock, in, uh, two clock input blocks. So our CSUM clocks actually deliver a 10 megahertz sine wave and a PPS pulse, or each clock delivers that. 
both of those clocks are connected to each FPJ, and then we have a clock select block, which takes those inputs, and we can, so if one of our time scales, if one, one, uh, if one of our time scales, one of our season clocks would break, we can say, well, use that one to get more redundancy. And then we have the N2P engine in the middle. So it's basically SFE plus Serdes, which re receives the stream, brings it into the FPGA. This goes into the N2P engine. The N2P engine does the processing, swaps the fields, fills in the timestamps, gives it to the transmit block, which then feeds it out of, out of the SFE. And also attached to this NTP engine, you have the MD5 engine and the shell one engine that do the hashing if we're using authenticated NTP. So key points for this FPGA, it's a streaming architecture. So it runs at wire speed. There's no buffering, no reordering. The latency is extremely predictable. It's sort of within 10 nanoseconds. So from within, from the point we get the packet in to it, when, we, when it gets out of the FPJ, the latency is always exactly the same, and there's a jitter of maybe 10 nanoseconds. And since this is a streaming architecture, and we actually have to be able to run MD5 and the SHA-1 hashes at 10 gigabits, it, they, they become really large. So I think about 90% of the logic cells in the FPJ today, they actually are the MD5 and SHA-1 implementations. The NTP logic is really tiny compared to them. So what's the bad about this one? Well, nothing really. It's been doing NTP really well. It's been doing it for, well, since 2016, what's that, six years now? And the bad thing is rather it doesn't support NTS, so it doesn't have scalable security. So we wanted to change that. So a new protocol, NTS, it adds authentication and encryption. It has two stages. So there's a first stage, which is called NTS KE, key establishment. So what you do is use the normal TLS infrastructure, the same one used for HTTPS certificates. So you can use, if you want to set up an NTS server, get a less encrypted cert certificate and you can use it with your NTS server. So the trust model for NTS is basically the same as for HTTPS. This runs on a PC, so I'm not going to talk all that much more about it. Then there's something called the timestamping, and I'm calling, the RFC doesn't say NTS TS, but that's the abbreviation I've used everywhere just to make, make it shorter in our internal documents. So that's NTP, same old NTP as before, with some extensions on it. It's stateless, which means that, so, uh, which makes it suitable for implementing an FPGA, almost. And the thing that ties the key establishment with the timestamping, the thing that ties them together are NTS cookies. So let's start with the cookies, since those are rather important. And now it's going to get tricky, so stop me if I'm, I'm too confusing. But basically, when you do the key establishment, the server and client, they agree on a set of keys. They, they exchange keys and get a client to server key, C2S, and a server to client key, S2C. Both sides know about those keys. The server takes those keys, let's see if I can get the pointer working here. So those two keys are then put in a cookie. They're encrypted by the server with something called a server key. The server, so now the cook, those are opaque. Nobody who sees the cookie can actually see the, can, can actually see the contents of that. The server adds a nonce just to make each cookie unique so that even if you transmit the same server, uh, client to server and server to client keys again, the, the cookie will look different. The server actually adds a key ID because the server can have multiple keys so we, it can rotate keys and not use a key for too long. And finally, all of this is signed. And so it's encrypted with the server key, it's signed with the server key. And the only one who knows the server key is the server. So the point of this is that by Doing this, the server can get a cookie and it can actually extract the C2S and C2C key later. And here's the key establishment protocol. It's, uh, well, I'm not going to go into details, but there's a TLS connection, and over the TLS connection, you get cookies, server key, S2C, C2S keys on the client side, and the client stores on its, on its local storage. And the server has a server key, but that's the only thing it has to know about. So how does a 
NTS timestamping request look then? Well, it's basically the same as normal NTP. So the first little block there, NTP request, that's the same 48 bytes as before. And then we add another unique identifier. This is so that the client sent out, uh, sends out a request and when it gets a response back, it will get the same unique identifier back and can see, okay, this is actually the same, the same uh, or this is the response to this request I made. And uh, unfortunately, this unique identifier has no limit in the protocol, so you can basically have, I think the, I think the minimum is 32 bytes, but you can actually send a kilobyte if you want. So that means that these extensions are variable size. You can actually, there's no fixed order, so you can change the order around, and the number of the fields, the extension fields, are, is, are also variable. So this make immediately becomes a bit more tricky to handle because there are no fixed fields. You have to do a lot more parsing. So when the client sends off a request, it adds a cookie and it signs the whole request with the C2S key that the client stored and knows about. And we're back to the cookie again. So the server gets the cookie and since the cookie contains the C2S and S2C key encrypted with server key, the server can actually verify the signature, can extract the C2S and S2C keys from the cookie, and now it knows the C2S and S2C again. So if we go back here, since this is signed with the C2S key, the server can verify, okay, the signature is correct. This is actually a request from a client that we have talked to before we've handed cookies to this client. The response is basically the same thing. It's a NTP response to begin with, 48 bytes, same unique identifier as from the request. The server generates a new cookie, or the client can actually ask for more cookies. So one or more cookies are in there, they're encrypted with the S2C key for the server to client communication, and is signed with S2C key. This is handed over to the client, and the client knows the S2C key, so the client can verify, okay, this reply is actually from it. This reply is actually from a server who know, knows, uh, shares the same keys as I do, and you can trace that back to, well, this comes from the TLS connection we made before, and then we have the normal HTTPS trust. And, uh, sorry, I won't, quiz you. I won't quiz you on this, but this is basically the whole graph of what's happening. So the left-hand side is all the processing that the client has to do, the right-hand side is the processing the server has to do. So. If you want to see this, look at the presentation later on, or look at our white papers, it's in there too. But the most important part is down on the left there, time. When the, all of this is done, the client has received time from the server, and it's time that has been authenticated, so you can actually trust it. It hasn't been tampered with, the timestamps haven't been modified, which is easy to do with NTP. So, let's go on to implementation. Well, Netnode has have been running NTS servers since 2019, when I did my proof of concept implementation. It's been running on a PC, or once again, redundant pieces in our server rooms. And we've been running this, telling people, this is a stable server, you can use it. There have some, been some changes in the protocol since from the draft to the actual RFC, and we're running backwards compatible servers until, well, people stop using them just because we don't want to break stuff. But the timestamping can be done in FPGA, but as I said, it's a lot more complex. One of the big issues, well, one issue is all this stuff with the fields can come in different orders, variable sizes, variable number of uh, fields, so we have to handle that. There's also the encryption algorithm. It's using AES, which is an encryption standard, which everybody knows and uses, and it's fairly easy to implement in FPGA. The problem is we're using a mode called SIV, and that is an, it's called an Authenticated Encryption and Associated Data Algorithm, AEAD. So you can do both encryption and signing, which is what I showed on the cookie, for example. It the problem with this is it requires multiple passes of the data. One pass to do the encryption, one pass to do the signing. And that means that you basically have the buffer data, and means that doing a streaming implementation is really hard, so we couldn't really just take our NTP design and reuse that one. So we had to chain things out, uh, things around a bit. So what we decided to do was to, let's build a bunch of small NTS engines. Each engine does a bit of buffering, is fairly slow, but we put in lots of them so that we can do things in parallel. 
So this is how the NTS FPGA looks. So you can recognize some things from before, the same PCI Express block for configuration status. We have the same clock blocks as the input, the same 10 gigabit receiver, the ten, same 10 gigabit transmitter, and in the middle we have a bunch of engines. So each engine takes a packet, buffers it, does all the processing that's needed, which can take sort of different amounts of time depending on how many cookies there are, the sizes of the, all the fields. And in front of that, we have the dispatcher. So the dispatcher takes the 10 gigabit stream, takes these packet and says, okay, there's a free engine, let's hand it over to that engine. And when the engine is done processing the data, well, we have the extractor, which sees, okay, an engine is done, let's take this and put it out on the 10 gigabit interface. So fairly similar, but also the, the, the sort of NTS core is totally different. So some key points about NTS FPGA, well, it was developed on the same VC709 reference board that we're using for NTP in production. It could fit about 16 NTS engines and can handle about three gigabits of traffic on that FPGA. And that's a bit too little. We wanted at least 10 gig. So we switched to a larger FPGA, throw more money at the problem, that usually solves things. So now we have a Silinx VCU118 board with 2.4 million logic cells or lookup tables compared to the 690,000 on the VC709. So this one is, a, well, three and a half times bigger. So with this, we could fit about 40 NTS engines and we can handle 10 gigabits of traffic at wire speed. And we've actually put this in production since, well, before Christmas last year, or yeah, Christmas 2021, so a few months ago. We're, we were planning to use the VC118, but then Arista turned up and Arista has a switch with an FPGA inside it, which is basically the same FPGA as on the VCU118 board, but in a much nicer form factor. So it's a 1U unit, it has 48 10 gig ports, it's standalone, redundant power supplies, all of that, which means that that made our sort of, we do not have to do the work of finding a PC, fitting everything inside that. So that, that was a really nice thing to do. Slightly more expensive than doing it by ourselves, but I mean, I'd rather have hardware with support than doing things myself. So just to give you a picture of how the FGA actually looks, this is an image from the from Silings Vivaldo, which is the tool we use to develop the FPGA software or the FPGA image. And this is the physical layout of logic cells within the FPGA. So all of those colored, colored, block up, colored blocks up here are NTS engines. So all those 40 NTS engines, well, they're right there. So with 40 engines, each, en each engine taking about 2% of the logic cells, we then end up that taking about 80% of the space in the FPGA. Over here, this little small thing, that's a 10 gigabit file. Doesn't take that much space on the FPGA because 10 gig ethernet is actually fairly simple at the logic side. The serializer, the, the, the serializer, the deserializer, they're actually hard IP that doesn't show up here. So, but this is the logic used to control the, the ethernet ports. So that's not all, not all that much. This part over here is slightly bigger. That's the PCIe block. That's also the same kind of serdes, but it speaks to PCI protocol. And PCI, the PCI protocol is fairly complex, so it ends up being fairly large. So compared to the PHY, which uses less than sort of 1% of the FPGA, the PCIe block uses about 3%. Then there's the dispatcher, and you can't see it here, because the dispatcher, the way the tools lay thing, the logic out, it actually ends up being a part of each and every engine here. So you can't really see where the dispatcher is, but it uses about 3% of the FPGA also. And then this whole thing down here is the extractor. So that's the thing that takes data from each engine and then, and then feed, uh, combines it all into one 10 gig stream and then feeds it out. And it's fairly sparse. You can see a lot of black, lot, lots of black blocks in there. And I'm no ex expert in FPGA development, but it kind of feels like we might not be using the resources of the, F resources of the FPGA that well with it. Okay. 
So a little retrospective on this. Well, the latency with NTS isn't as predictable as for NTP, since each engine has to buffer data, have different processing times. If we receive a big packet with a small packet afterwards, we might be done with a small packet before the big packet is done being processed. So the small packet can end up being reordered and be transmitted before the big one. So that adds quite a bit of jitter. Uh, the, due to the, since having 40 different engines, the dispatcher and the extractor that have to do all the uh, sort of management and hand off the packets and take the packets from each engine, they become quite large and complex. And when it comes to jitter, well, it, it adds a few microseconds of jitter. It doesn't matter because the first router in, in front of the system will anyway add mi tens of microseconds of jitter. If you're a few hops away on the internet, it's going to add even more. So the same thing is true. So for bragging rights, it would be nice to keep the jitter down, but it doesn't matter in practice. So improvements, well, we might want to, having these many engines makes things complex. Maybe we could redo things, try to speed up each engine a bit and make them fewer, but make the dispatching extractor rather simpler, maybe. It, it's tricky because if we do that, well, we have to optimize one part and it might not be possible to do that. Another thing actually is that we, I think we have a bit too much sort of duplicated functionality in, in each engine, which might, it might be possible to move to dispatcher or the, to the extractor, but that would, uh, then it has to run at 10 gigabits instead of a much slower speed. So that might also be hard. So there are room for improvement, but we don't know really. So as a summary of this, the NTS FPGA, it works just fine. It handles 10 gigabit. It is in production, has been in production a few months. I do monitoring of all this with NTP second crony. It seems to work fine. And also, if you want to try this out, DBN 11 has NTP second crony that are compatible with the RFC. Older versions used the protocol in from the draft, and that's not compatible with the latest version of NTS. But, and if you're on Ubuntu, I think the next Ubuntu release in a few weeks will actually have, the next LTS release in a few weeks will actually have Crony and NTP, which are new enough. The older LTS version 20.04 does not have it. And as I said, there is some room for improvement on the FPGA, but still it works well enough. So last slide, uh, lots of links here. A link to the net node time and frequency page on NetNode, NetNode are white papers if you want to read more about NTS, both the protocol and the FPGA implementation. All the source code is available here. We have our production servers, so feel free to start using them. And as I said, I'm Christopher Weinigel, so if you don't have any questions right now, please feel free to mail me. Thank you. So we've, we've hit that time. Um, do we have time for questions? Up to you, if you want to stay. I, How hungry are you? <laughs> Those who are hungry, leave. People <laughs> looking, looking. Uh, are, there, are there any questions, quick questions for Pat or Krista? Otherwise, we can take it yeah. into the break. Both Krista and myself will be around here. Yeah. So. Uh, sorry, Mem, yes. Yeah, yes, it's Mem at NetNode. Uh, you talked about the classic NTP with a practical precision of like 10 milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, is the same precision at with NTS, or will this complexity and all the things make it a bit less uh, precise, but rather secure instead, or is it, it still it's, it's, it's the same. I mean, since we're doing this in an FPGA, it's fast. So basically, as I said, there is slightly more jitter. We have a couple of tens of microseconds instead of 10 nanoseconds. But at the first router hop, it doesn't matter anymore. Any other questions before we go for lunch? And as we said, uh, both Path and Krista will be here, so please yeah. come uh, to see them if you need anything more about NTS. But for now, thank you. Join me in thanking Path and Krista for the presentation.